I got this little module a while back and I just added it on to an order as I so often do from China because I thought it might be quite interesting just to play about with and see what the quality was. And I'll show you what it does. They class it as a speed controller for AC motors and it works at the full 240 volts. So I'm going to tread carefully here. And basically when you turn it up, it'll act like a dimmer. You can vary the intensity of the lamp or if you had a, a, a motor connected, a universal motor, you'd be able to vary the speed of the motor and that would work with power tools. They rate this at 2 kilowatts. I'm not so sure um, that I think it would get quite hot if it was used continually like that. Now, notice that the filament is now quite dim. It's not gone out completely, but it's uh, very dim. Now, watch this. I'm going to unplug it. I'm going to take an insulated screwdriver and I'm going to adjust this little potentiometer here. Because this potentiometer is for adjusting a minimum threshold that the, when you turn it on you can't turn the motor below a certain speed and the point of that is that you don't, if you're using it with a fan or something like that, you wouldn't want to actually um, stall the motor. So it, it hasn't made a huge difference but you may see that's just a little bit brighter than it was before. And if I was to continue turning that with an insulated screwdriver, it's multi-turn potentiometer. Um, as I turn this, that will gradually get brighter and brighter. And then when I use the potentiometer, it will still go up to the full output, but when I turn it down, it won't go below that level. And that is, as I say, it's just a, to set a minimum level to stop motors stalling. So I'm going to unplug that now, and we shall explore this circuit. So I'm going to disconnect all the wires completely from it. Now let's see, I'm just going to bridge out any capacitors in the back here, just for a case I get a little dingles. That should be it. I'll do the thumb check. Yep, that's them discharged. I'm going to take the wires off. And you know what, I think we'll just reverse engineer this because it's not, it's a standard dimmer circuit. Right. So, this is the module in question. I got it from a supplier called Synedi, quite a common supplier for electronic stuff. And it cost £1.68 to get this shipped from China, complete. And I did some sums, I priced the components up, and the components, if I bought these components, minus the PCB and minus this potentiometer mount, the cost, and I I'd also didn't include the resistors because they're just what I regard as consumables and hardware things like screws and things like that. The combined component cost uh, for small quantities from my supplier was £6.20 plus 20% VAT. So £1.68 versus for you know, for the fully built module versus the £6.20 plus VAT. And there are two components on this uh, module that are just worthy of note. The triac and this terminal. To buy this triac, it's a standard triac, it's an isolated tab BTA 16600B, would cost me, the triac was £1.86. The triac would cost me more than the module. Likewise, the most expensive component on the board for me to buy was this four way terminal with the barriers between the connectors, and that was £2.06. So, you know what? It's ridiculous. It's very hard to compete with China at this, this sort of level. So here's the circuit. Um, it's a standard uh, triac uh, control, and it's got a, a modest heat sink on it. They rate they rate it uh, two kilowatts. That at 240 volts AC would be about eight amps, and that would mean this under load would be dissipating about eight watts of power from this heat sink. So it would get pretty hot. Um, the terminals are very good. They're proper barrier terminals, and what they've got is that two outer terminals are just linked together. They don't go anywhere near the control circuitry, so it's just the two inner terminals that are actually involved in the dimming. So I'm going to get the notepad, and uh, we'll doodle this circuit down. So, we've already ascertained that, say for instance, um, we're going to switch, say we're going to switch live through it. So the neutral and the neutral are just linked together. They're not connected. Uh, and I'll just put that load and feed. 
However, the live live feed, and to be honest, it's, it would work in either direction, and the live load will have the triac connected uh, across it. Now, looking at triacs, when you look at them with the tab facing the heat sink, the terminals are normally in the order of MT1, MT2, oop, and gate. Now, usually, the gate, uh, the gate is actually referenced to MT1. If you can imagine, it's almost like a transistor that as soon as you raise it a certain voltage above MT1, it will turn on. But the bizarre thing about tracks is that because they're AC components, they can switch either polarity between MT1 and MT2. The gate can be either positive with respect to MT1, or it can be negative with respect to MT1. So normally, the load is connected to MT2, and the control for the gate is normally derived from there. But um, let's uh, break this down in the circuitry here. So, the triac is connected between the input and the output. And this is a symbol for a triac, and there's the gate. This is MT1, MT2, gate. Um, usually, for filtering, there's a snubber network, and this module is also a bit naughty. It really should have a choke to limit uh, radio interference because it, it, it switches. The way it controls the power is if you wanted half power, what it's actually doing, if that's a sine wave, if you've got it set at half power, it's actually turning on at the top and the bottom of the sine wave here and on each half wave. So it's actually turning on with quite a spike, real blast there. And likewise, it turns on there, and at the mid position, at the half intensity or half motor speed, that is the when most interference occurs. So normally, on the output, you'd have, uh, basically, you'd have a choke, but they're, they're not using that here. So, um, the suppression circuitry, there's all, there should be suppression circuitry. I can see that it's going to be this resistor here and this capacitor. Let's uh, check what those capacitors are. Normally, a suppression filter would be 100 nanofarad and um, 100 ohms. Now, there's other components in the circuit here, so it may not read properly. That's close enough, 100 ohms. That's uh, showing 97 ohms. What about this one? 101. So that's uh, they're both 100 nano, which makes sense, because um, it minimises the number of components I have to keep in stock. Um, the resistor is sandwiched in between these two. It's a sort of half watt metal film resistor by the look of it. So let's uh, put this to ohms, and I'm guessing 100, but I might be wrong. A hundred ohms. That's very classic textbook. Um, okay. So we've got a snubber network which is just going straight across here with a resistor, 100 ohm and a capacitor, 100 nano. And the purpose of this is that when uh, you've got um, inductive loads you're driving, nasty loads that are likely to create a bit of a spike, um, you, it'll be a high voltage, low current spike. When the triac turns off, you have to snub it with um, this filter. And this filter will show a low resistance to that spike. The, the spike would basically have to uh, charge up that capacitor before the voltage rose above the level that it could interfere with the triac. If it wasn't there, you can end up with false triggering of the triac. The resistor is mainly here, I believe, to avoid um, when the triac turns on, if you didn't have the resistor, it would just be a capacitor across it, and that capacitor would be charging up to the full mains voltage in each half cycle. And if the triac turned on, it would be dumping that capacitor suddenly through it. And it's that could cause interference, it could also cause a bit of extra stress on the um, capacitor, uh, the triac, should I say. And I'm not 100% sure. Always I've considered the snubber network, 100 ohm, 100 nano, it's also quite commonly used across switch contacts because it suppresses the arcing that occurs across them. So um, I've never really looked into it too much, other than I'd, I know the capacitor will pose a low impedance to... Um, basically high voltage transients and arcing, so to speak. Now, the gate of the triac is connected to a little component. It's connected rather predictably to a diac. 
Now a DIAC is a specialist component. It's, you always find them in use with triacs. And the point of the DIAC is it's bipolar. It, it works in both polarities. And as soon as the voltage goes above about 32 volts, it will suddenly turn on and its voltage will suddenly drop. And what that means is that when you've got something feeding like, um, like a capacitor, which this probably is, uh, being charged up and it's feeding the track. When it reaches the the trigger voltage, it will suddenly snap on, and the track will suddenly be given a jab and spiked on, and that's to avoid because you can't really control tracks with just gently ramping it up. It, it pro produces unusual results. Sometimes you get a uh, half wave, the track turning on half wave. It could actually damage the track if it's not turned on fully. So that's this component here is to ensure the track's turned on completely. So the diac then goes to a capacitor, the other capacitor, which is 100 nano. And that will be charged up in each half wave. Now let's see, um, that's going to be, oh right, okay. Now both these potentiometers have two pins common um, and they're both actually in parallel. Okay. So let's, uh, here's, we'll call this the main control potentiometer. And they're, it's connected like that. Um, and then it goes down to there. Oh no, it doesn't. Uh, there's going to be another resistor in there to limit the, uh, see now, the other potentiometer is going to be the one that's for adjusting it, and that just appears to be in parallel with it, the little trimmer potentiometer at the end. And that's going down there. And there must be a resistor. Yes, there is a resistor. And this will... That's the, the resistor I've actually drawn there already, which is... What value is that? Assuming I can actually... Uh, So that's going to be this resistor here, 4.7K. Four point seven kilo ohms. So if this is the trimmer one, let's see what these values are. Basically speaking, what's happening here is on each half wave of the sine wave, this capacitor starts charging up through the resistors. Um, if you were to ignore this resistor at the moment, this one here, then depending on the position of the knob, because this is the sort of, this is the uh, right knob next to that, and we'll just trim. Depending on the position of the knob, it will vary the amount of the speed at which that capacitor charges up. The further it is towards the um, this end, the actual like the live feed the faster the current will flow through and that's where this resistor comes in because it stops it basically just being connected directly to the live feed. Um, so that uh, capacitor will charge up in each half wave until it reaches the magic voltage of 32 volts, the, the diac. The diac will turn on and at that point it will then shunt out here. It then turns on as a switch and this track is held on by the current flowing through it from the load. So then uh, there wouldn't be any more current flowing in this circuit at all because it would be bypassed by the track. And that happens in both halves of the wave. <clears throat> so what value is that potentiometer, I wonder? Oh, this is, a, this is where it gets tricky, because there's two in parallel. I don't see a value on this potentiometer. I could theoretically turn it to the extreme end and measure across the outputs, but it's in parallel with that other one. So if I was to wind this one back until it starts clicking, and it's quite a lot of turns in this one, this apparently is 2 mega ohm, it's 205. That's quite high. 2 mega ohm. So if I turn this one all the way back, you can tell when you get to the end of these because they click. Hear it? So that's me reached the end of that, so that should be at its most extreme. So um, if I turn this one this other way around, it should get, at least give me a rough idea of what value this one is. 
I should be able to guess. Hopefully it'll be quite different from the trimmer one because then that'll give a more accurate reading. It'll make me, it'll allow me to guess its value better. 0.4. 470k? That sounds about right. So that was, um, that was measuring 400 and 6,000 ohms, right? Okay, here's a challenge for you guys. If I pull a sheet out, I rarely use, I rarely calculate capacitors, particularly differing value capacitors in parallel. And right now I can't actually remember the formula for that. I'm used to, more used to doing it in series. So if there were two resistors in parallel, And the voltage measured across them was 406,000 ohms. And one of them is set to its extreme, so it's 2 meg ohms. So that's the resistance measured across. Is that one going to be 470k? I think it is. Because that would be a nice round value. And it's a fairly standard valve potentiometer. But uh, yes, I'm rubbish at calculating. I, I very rarely calculate capacitors in parallel. If I'm doing it, it's usually the same values. So uh, I, I honestly haven't a clue. I'm not even going to try that right now in case I make a dick of myself. So um, that's the circuit. We'll provisionally pinch that in at 470k. And it's not that complicated, is it, really? Just basically on each half wave, the, these resistors charge in this capacitor until it reaches the threshold voltage of the diac. The diac then triggers the triac, which turns on, and that's when it turns on in the sine wave. It's very simple. Hmm. And so cheap and useful. I'm not 100% sure what it's useful for, but um, I've got it anyway as a little uh, module in my arsenal. Oh, notice that um, it's got this uh, solder flowing uh, here on the pads. Now that is supposed to increase the current rating of the, the, the tracks. I guess it probably has some effect on that, but to me, the greatest effect that has is in the event of a short circuit, if something fails, the higher thermal mass that these gives the pads will most likely protect those tracks from being blown to smithereens, as happened with that uh, insect killer thing recently when all the tracks vaporised off the back of the board. Um, it, it means they're less likely to blow like fuses, but. Um, it's a nice enough little module, and just criminal that, you know, it costs me less than just the blooming triac. Oh, what can you do?